to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here once again today with John Harrigan and with Bill Schofield. How are you guys this week? Doing well. Doing great. Awesome, awesome. Anything new going on in y'all's worlds? Well, just trying to come to term with the news. There's too much to keep up with. A little overwhelming. News is crazy. Yeah. It really is. I mean, for our listeners, we're in the midst of uh, the first week of the the riots across America related to the death of George Floyd. And yeah, just uh, top that on top of the coronavirus pandemic. And uh, all the other interesting news going on in the world, it, it's a crazy time. Well, and I mean, the real news that uh, that they gave Joe Zhu to Carol Baskin is I I can't I can't make sense of the world right now. <laughs> Do you see that as one of the signs of the end times? I think I think the end is near. <laughs> I mean, it's beyond. It's getting serious. It, it is serious. Is, this is <clears throat> epic news. Well, it's great to be with you guys again today, and uh, to our listeners, it's great to have you with us. Today, we want to tie in a lot of the concepts we've been talking about in the last three episodes of the podcast, and Romans 1 really just sets the tone well to to bring together the the themes of what is apocalyptic, what is the gospel, how does that all tie in with cosmology and the Great Commission and the hope of Israel, these kinds of things that we've been speaking about in the past few episodes. So we just want to take a little bit of time today to work through some passages here in, or some verses here in Romans 1. So with that, let's just dive right in. Um, Romans chapter 1 Starting at verse 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. So I love this passage because Paul is so clearly writing about so many concepts that we've already been discussing in our past few episodes. You get this idea of the gospel in verse 1, a pre-existing framework for it from the prophets in verse 2, the idea of the Davidic Messiah in verse 3, the resurrection in verse 4, and the discipleship of the Gentiles in verse 5. Yeah, so I think Romans 1 gives us a good kind of framework for Paul's understanding of the gospel and his mission to the Gentiles, and that that understanding is presupposing his Jewish apocalyptic worldview that was prevalent in the first century. And so rather than redefining or reimagining that worldview, that worldview is not just a helpful background to his gospel, but really constitutes the fabric of it within which he understands the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the death of Jesus the Messiah, and what that means, and what his return means. And so, apocalyptic, again, is just kind of is a a word that is used by historical scholars to communicate that Paul understood history moving towards a cataclysmic uh, end a radical redefinition of history, or reversal would be a better word, in which the day of God is going to come, God's going to make a new heavens and new earth, raise the dead, punish the wicked eternally, um, and fulfill the covenants, restore the kingdom to Israel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is what he means by calling in the verse 1 himself as a servant of Jesus the Messiah. And so the attribution of Messiah to this guy from Nazareth incorporates all of those expectations that were common to Judaism at the time, and that that composes his gospel. Um, Not just that Christ died for us, though that is uh, a salient feature, but that Christ died for us so that we can inherit the expectation of Jewish eschatology, eternal life, the resurrection, the age to come, etc. And bouncing off of that, 
you see the transition there where <clears throat> even though we're just talking about introductory statements, he says he was set apart for the gospel of God, which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this is like we've been talking about for the last few weeks, that the gospel from a first century Jewish perspective, not only was the content of the gospel was filled by the prophets, right? Like John just mentioned a second ago. But it was increasingly seen along apocalyptic lines, specifically by the time you reach the first century. So you take the content, whereas maybe you would have taken the content of Isaiah 40, and you could have looked at that at one point and said, uh, like we studied a few weeks ago, that, the, um, that your God will come, and that he will bring recompense, and he will bring his reward with him. And you can say, well, he, you know, he'll come at some point, and, he'll, and you know, he, that might be a reference to how he's going to deliver us from the land of the north, and that might be a reference to this. But over time, it became really clear that these things are really going to be consolidated, and the response and the... Uh, the, the action, the decisive action of God related to these things is going to be at the end of the age. Again, splitting the ages. And so the gospel that is from the prophetic literature that he's saying that was beforehand through the prophets is just like John said. He's referencing this body of material that prophesied about this scenario God, about God bringing um, deliverance and inaugurating the age to come and these things um, before or at the day of the Lord, just before the resurrection of the dead, and embodying a lot of those ideas. So so just like the title of the podcast, apocalyptic and gospel tend to embody the, the idea that there was an anticipation for these events to come together at a period separating the two ages. Right, which I think he really picks up in verse 16 in chapter 1, where he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And so the death of Jesus is the power, the means by which you attain salvation. And all the Jewish apocalyptic literature, the literature written around the time of the first century, salvation is from the wrath to come. Salvation is from the day of God and the wrath that's associated and judgment that's associated with it. And so I think you get a, you know, the same thing, for example, comes to mind in chapter five, where he says, since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, verse nine, so the death of Jesus, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? And so the gospel is fundamentally twofold. It involves the death of Jesus to deliver us from the wrath to come, the day of God to inherit eternal life and the resurrection. Yeah, that's good, guys. It's really good. I think if our listeners recall the last several episodes, especially when we work through some passages in Luke's gospel, where we looked at Luke 3 and Luke 9 and Luke 20, and we really saw that the core of the gospel message that John and the 12 and Jesus all preached had to have its roots and its grounding in the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible, what the prophets said. Uh, and, and we saw even, you know, how the gospel was preached before Jesus even died. And so to understand that the gospel begins uh, and, and has its roots in the Old Testament prophetic literature, um, this really sets up the context for the next few verses that Paul begins here, opening up his letter to the Romans with. So verse 3, concerning his son who is descended from David according to the flesh. This is clearly referencing something um, from from Second Samuel. Do you, you want to take a second to dive into that? Well, and just before you jump, before uh, you jump into that verse 2, Paul makes explicit, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So Paul has in mind that his gospel is explicitly from the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Yeah, that's right. That's good. <clears throat> yeah, I think, Josh, um, yeah, we've just become accustomed to skipping over those passages. Uh, the fact that he was yeah. descendant of David almost looks like a messianic checklist to us. 
You know, it was like right. there's a list of prophecies that Jesus had to fulfill, and but this meant a lot more. The content of the prophecy is actually important, right? And so we have in Second Samuel seven, starting in verse twelve. So it's uh, it's it's known as the the Davidic covenant when um, God visits David and makes a covenant with him, and he says. It's beginning in verse 12 of 2 Samuel 7, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you. He will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom and, and he will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. So, so this is a great example of how some of the oracles were were being seen because again you may look at this and say oh it's it's all about solomon and yet it's a very underwhelming result to see solomon as the answer to i will establish his kingdom and i will establish the throne of his kingdom forever right especially in light of what happens just after solomon the kingdom's divided and then comes the two exiles a couple centuries later so it's the same with all the themes right. as they progressively get pushed to their ultimate end. So the same way with messianic expectation. Absolutely. And, and so in the Psalms, you have the same thing. In Psalm 2, it's another reference to um, uh, Psalm 2, 7. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth. As your possession, you will break them with a rod of iron and you will shatter them like pottery. I think also of Psalm 89 along the same lines. He will cry to me, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So you have that same son language. That's good. Yeah. And I think that even as you're saying, guys, that this gets pushed to its ultimate end. Yeah, good. You know, we could reference even the angel's words to Mary in Luke chapter 1, where the angel says, verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Right, and I think what's important to note in verse 4 in Romans 1 is that Paul doesn't have in mind later arguments over divinity, messianic, or Jesus' uh, divine identity versus human identity. That's not what's going on in Paul's mind in, in Romans 1. He, he clearly makes... Because that later became everything. Everything was a reference to Jesus' divinity. Right, that became everything. Now, clearly, there's... There's ideas about messianic divinity already happening in Second Temple Judaism, and right. Paul makes declarations that that Jesus. I'm thinking, you know, First Corinthians eight or whatever, that he makes declarations along those lines of Jesus' divinity. But in Romans one, that's not what Son of God references. He would, if he used the phrase Son of Man, that held much more messianic divinity. Uh, associations with divinity than right. Son of God. Son of God was, because of Daniel 7, Son of God really associates much more humanity and is associated directly with the Davidic covenant and messianic expectation. So when he's declared the Son of God in verse 4, Paul is really just associating his gospel with the prophetic literature and messianic expectation that Jesus is the Messiah, the King of Israel. Yeah, right. So so what's happening is that Jesus' resurrection is not a fulfillment of the expectation of the resurrection of the dead. It's a confirmation of the resurrection of the dead. And thus, in the mind of a first century Jew, it's a confirmation of this larger worldview, right? Right. His, his resurrection didn't change that worldview, but rather affirmed it and affirmed the expectation that Jesus is actually going to return to Jerusalem, raise the dead, rule from Zion, etc. And be the judge of the living and the dead, even as Paul said in what we talked about in one of our past episodes in Acts right. 17, right? Where uh, the proof that he has given him to be 
the judge of the living and the dead on the day of the Lord, inclusive of everything Jewish eschatology is that he has been raised from the dead. Uh, and this is, you know, what Paul affirms in Acts 17 that we looked at in a past episode. Which I think leads us then into verse 5 and the mission. Yeah, absolutely. Because here in verse 5, I'll just reread it here. It says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. And I think with this, Paul's understanding of his mission is to bring the Gentiles into the obedience of faith. And so again, this is not a change in Jewish eschatology, but it's how do we bring Gentiles into Jewish eschatology? And, and this is more than just being about good discipleship of, okay, well, stop sinning and do some good deeds, and then you'll go to be with Jesus in heaven when you die. This is about affirming, forcefully affirming Jewish eschatology and saying, how are the Gentiles brought into this? Yeah, I think an important connection here in Romans 1 that Paul intentionally makes with the context or with this uh, with the concept of obedience of faith is found down in, in, chap- or in verse 17 of chapter 1. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man will live by faith. And so this is a familiar phrase, comes from Habakkuk and the prophets. And just to, just to give a, I'm going to go back there briefly, just to touch on, because it gets referenced a number of times in the New Testament, and it's one of those verses that has been so brought into tradition and a, and a certain understanding of it that it's so random when it gets cited. It's just super random when the, when, when the quotation comes up. So if you look back in Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1 is essentially this gnarly prophecy of the Chaldeans, of the Babylonians co- coming, and it's really intense, and Habakkuk kind of throws a little bit of a temper tantrum, and he tries to get God to change his mind in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, the Lord responds, beginning in verse 2, to like his, his intercession, right? His, I call it a temper tantrum, but he's just trying to kind of twist God's arm. And he says, the Lord said to me, record the vision, write it on tablets so that the one who reads it may run, right? So essentially, I spoke to you, you asked me to change my mind, now I'm telling you, write the thing down. It's, it's going to happen. The, the, the oracle is going to happen just like I said it would. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. It will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. And so the, the thrust of the passage here is to affirm the certainty of this oracle. And, and you have this, this sometimes quoted in a goofy context, so that the one who reads it may run. So it involves a, a, uh, basically the surrounding of, and the desolation of Jerusalem. And so the reference to the one who reads it may run is so that the one who hears the oracle, they can actually leave town before the thing happens. So they don't die. So they don't die. <laughs> It's not about a vision statement, right? But so it will certainly come. It will not delay. So overwhelmingly, he's affirming the, the absolute certainty of the things that are talked about in chapter 1. And then he says, Behold, for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. He separates the proud and the righteous. And he said, But the righteous will live by faith. And so this is, a, again... So, like, how does that even fit in the context? So, you know, there's um, one of the things about this passage is a lot of people have highlighted that the word munah, not emuna, the word munah in Hebrew actually really means steadfastness or reliability or trustworthiness. And so the righteous man will live by steadfastness, by trustworthiness. It's a little bit awkward, even in Hebrew. And so... The, the, uh, there's a couple of commentaries that I know of that, that have highlighted the fact that this is most likely not a reference to the righteous person, but about the oracles, that they're reliable and they're trustworthy. And so a way you could translate that would be the righteous man will live as though the oracles were reliable. Yeah, which is just uh, the, the, 
you boil it down, and all Paul is saying by quoting Habakkuk 2 is that he wants the Gentiles to trust and rely upon the scriptures of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Right. Just bringing them into the obedience of faith, trusting in those oracles the way that he trusts in them as a first century Jew. Because it's, it's not really that m- mysterious of language if you understand what he's saying. And this is, you don't even really need Habakkuk 2 to understand what he's saying. He's basically saying, I, I'm, I'm, I was given apostleship to bring about this response to the proclamation of the Jewish oracles among the Gentiles. Well, and Paul, like the whole letter of Romans, says the same thing throughout. And it closes, I think the most, for me, the most powerful chapter of the book of Romans is chapter 15, where he basically closes the book the same way he opens it. Chapter 16 is is mostly just greetings and, and that kind of deal. But chapter 15 is the real close, and he, he climaxes in verses 8 and 9 where he says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So he summarizes that the life, death, resurrection of Jesus in toto is to confirm the promises of the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, to confirm the the promises given to the patriarchs. Not to redefine, not to reimagine, but actually to confirm, and that his resurrection confirm that those things. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, which he picks up, he really fleshes out in chapter 11, that God's mission to the Gentiles is a sub-narrative within a presupposed Jewish narrative. And so, his goal for the Gentiles is to bring the Gentiles into that Jewish narrative from the prophetic literature of the Tanakh. And then he quotes a bunch of passages out of the Tanakh in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Psalm, a couple Psalms, Deuteronomy 32, Isaiah 11, all of which have the Gentiles worshiping the God of Israel. And so he's trying to get these Gentiles in Rome to recognize the God of Israel, to recognize the narrative of the God of Israel and the covenants, and to worship the God of Israel, which is what he climaxes with in verse 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And so, I think this really summarizes his goal for the nations, for the Gentiles in chapter 1, verse 5, bringing all the nations into the obedience of faith is bringing them into the knowledge of the God of Israel in the scriptures, into the hope of the God of Israel, that they may abound in hope with all joy and peace in believing. Right, because God ultimately, what he's promised through the prophets— is going to come to pass. He's guaranteed it, and he's proven it, especially through the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul says, well, we need to get the Gentiles on board. You know, we need to get them into this story. And I think this is super profound, very different than maybe some of our listeners who have heard maybe a a typical Romans Road presentation of the book of Romans, that again, as we're saying, this is not a redefinition or a reimagination of the gospel, but it's a forceful affirmation of it as defined by the law and the prophets. That's good, guys. Really good. Well, and it just makes it simple, right? Because it, there's high continuity with Paul's native Jewish worldview. It makes things fit. It Once you bring in a redefinition of Jewish apocalyptic f- thought, once you bring in Oh, well, Paul is spiritually fulfilling the Davidic hopes, you know, with the ascension, and Jesus is spiritually ruling, and the mission to the Gentiles is a spiritual actualization of the hope of Israel, and just all of this strange nonsense that modern theological discourse engages in, it makes it impossible to understand it in a simple, straightforward way. And so I think understanding Paul's worldview helps... uh, helps make sense of Paul's mission to the Gentiles, it, it simplifies it. Right. And and when John 
values the simplicity of it. We're not saying that that what makes something valuable is that it's simple. We're saying what makes something valuable in terms of the gospel is that it's actually what they thought of as the gospel. And generally, reconstructions of the gospel rely on all these mechanisms that were so foreign to a first century Jew. And so, in reality, once you start to break it down and it becomes about just some very elementary things, and you don't have to import all these fancy mechanisms to understand the Bible. This is, we've, we've all talked about this before. The number of people that we've worked through the gospel, and you sit down week one, and everybody goes, well, that's really complicated. You go, no, I promise. This is simple. What you know is complicated. And they're all like, no, 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 no. I go, give me, give me a few weeks. And then without fail, every single one of them. Yep. Oh my gosh, you're right. That's yep. simple. What I thought was complicated. Yep. Yep. So true. I, and I think ultimately this comes down to the question of is God trustworthy? Are, Amen. is his words, are his simple. words reliable? C- can we rely on what he said as he said it in the law and the prophets affirmed by the words of Jesus and then the words of the apostles? And again, why we're seeking to understand this in a first century Jewish apocalyptic context is because that was their world. And Though I, in, you know, I think, um, John, you've got a good one liner that I've said to some of my students here, which is the gospel is not, it's, it's not complicated, but it, it, to actually obey it and, and to follow it out and to see it to its ultimate conclusion, it, it, this is what's difficult. It, it's not mm-hmm. hard to understand. It, it's not complicated. That's good. It's not complicated, but it's hard. Yeah. Which I think leads us to the so what of, of what do we do with this and what's the application for us today? Yeah. How then shall we live? Which I think is discipleship. It, it's, it's not, it's always discipleship and not hard to understand, but definitely hard to walk out. So well, I have a couple short passages that were well, one short and one a little bit longer to come to mind just to encapsulate it. Like John was just in Romans 15 and in verse 4, it says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So it's being able to look back at the prophetic witness and to be strengthened with encouragement and hope, because it's when you lose hope that compromise sets in and that you begin to deviate from the path of eternal life. And one of the, one of the passages that comes up um, that's come up to me a lot lately. Last week in our fellowship, I, I, I focused on this passage, Isaiah 2, starting in, in, uh, in verse 2. Again, we're in the middle of these riots going on and the outcry, um, you know, the, about police brutality and, and, and these things. <clears throat> but uh, so verse 2, now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord, which is always a reference to the house of the Lord, is always a reference to the temple, will be established as the chief of the mountains and raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. So all the Gentiles, right? All the Gentiles will stream to it, and many people will come and they will say. So imagine this as a picture of eternal life. The nations will say to one another, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. So this is an exhortation, a prophetic exhortation. So it's from Gentiles speaking to one another about approaching God on Mount Zion. And it says, For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many nations. He will render decisions for many peoples. And listen to this description. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. So this picture, this being the the picture that you have when you think of eternal life versus, as we've joked before, that far side comic with the guy sitting on the cloud saying, I wish I would have bought a magazine. So this being the picture of eternal life, when you turn on the news and you see the riots 
and you see the outcry and you see all the confusion and being able to have the certainty to be able to say, it's not going to be like this forever. Look what's coming. Like the, the word of the Lord will go forth from Zion and people will actually learn to walk in his ways and war will cease from sea to sea. And verse five ends this and it says, come house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is essentially discipleship in light of this picture of the end of the age and of the, and of the world to come. Right, and Paul picks this up a a number of times where he talks about walking worthy of the kingdom of God and being children of light. And even in Romans 13, you get the same language where he says, uh, verse 11, for salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is almost over. The day is at hand. So, so what? Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. And so discipleship is really according to destiny, according to eschatology. I mean, it's according to design, how we were made in the beginning. We weren't made, as he goes on, not in orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarreling, jealousy, etc., We weren't made for that stuff in the beginning, in the garden. We're not destined for those things at the parousia, the coming of Christ Jesus in the day of God and the age to come. Therefore, let us walk according to our design and our destiny, the hope of our calling, and let us uh, put on, as he says in verse 14 of chapter 13, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And the flesh gets used a number of times to just talk about your life in this age, right? Galatians 2, therefore, I have been crucified with Christ and the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. And so the life between now and the resurrection of the dead at the day of Christ Jesus, I live by faith in him who died for me to present me righteous before the judgment seat of God at his coming. And that this is how discipleship played out according to the light of the oracles. And this is what Paul's trying to do for the Gentiles, is to bring the Gentiles into the faith of the oracles, into the hope of eternal life, and to walk that out in obedience, producing fruit in keeping with repentance. That's right, right. yeah. And I think... I think ultimately this is Paul's mission, right? To bring the Gentiles into the obedience of faith. And this is why he says, even in Romans 15, verse 20, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, right? So Paul ultimately here in Romans 15, verse 20, even as we talked about uh, in one of our past episodes in the Great Commission, because God has appointed Jesus to be the judge of the living and the dead on the day of the Lord, Go and disciple the Gentiles into the obedience of faith. And again, this is what Paul is doing. It's really the apocalyptic context of the gospel, of what the law and the prophets have spoken that will come to pass on a real day and a climactic day in the future. That is what drives Paul's mission to the Gentiles. And, and I, I feel even, you know, for us, I mean, this ought to be what drives us as Gentiles to encourage and provoke and stir others in light of the day of judgment, in light of the coming day of the Lord to fulfill everything that the law and the prophets has spoken. Amen. So with that, we're going to wrap up today's episode. Thanks for joining us today, our listeners. We hope you join us again next week as we continue to look at more of these really important themes from the scriptures. God bless, and thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.